good morning. A reminder that I wrote that. I've, I was sitting there thinking to myself, like, when did I, when did I say that? Like, whoever said it is brilliant. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'm sure that, first of all, I know there's somebody in here like, Jesus, he could have at least put on a collar shirt. Well, here's the thing, you know, I, uh, <laughs> you know, here's the thing, I, I'm not really the most formal guy. I think uh, formality is for the unfamiliar, um, at least in my world. Uh, plus, when you work in the arts, they always say it's okay for you to show up late and underdressed, right? It's the one perk, it's the one perk of being an artist. Here's the thing, guys, I'm going to be honest with you, um, because I, that's all I really have is my honesty, my truth. I, I only move and operate at one speed, that's the speed of me. I hope you are okay with that. If not, this is going to be a bumpy ride for you because that's really all I have to offer. Most of you probably have no idea who I am, and that is awesome. It's all right with me. Um, it's nice to be in spaces where you get to reintroduce yourselves and uh, we get to sort of make some human connections in an honest way uh, without any preconceived notions or uh, perceptions of who you think I might be. Uh, my name is Jason Reynolds. I'm from Washington, D.C. I've written 13 books. Um, most of which are for children, most of all of which are about black children, because that's what I used to be, um, and what I still am, by the way, uh, a black child. Uh, all of us in this room are, are children. We like to believe that we are grown because it makes us feel good about the way we interact with people younger than us, but the truth of the matter is that all of us are growing. Nobody's actually grown, and if you think you are, then that's where the danger begins, right? So me, I am a grown child. I write for smaller children. Uh, most of whom are between the ages of 12 and 18, sometimes 21, depending upon the situation. Uh, all of these stories are about black children. The one I am most famous for is probably Miles Morales, Spider-Man, the black Spider-Man, the one that the movie is based on, okay? That's who I am. Uh, that's what I've done. So the, uh, the, majority, the majority of my life uh, is spent speaking to young people. I travel around the world 120 to 150 days a year. Um, I'm on an airplane most of the time. I, and with a quick aside, what's funny, when I, was, when I got here earlier, somebody asked me, like, what, do you at least fly first class? I say, yeah, I fly first class, I fly first class. And first class is a funny thing. I don't know, this is, just, this is what this whole speech is going to be, by the way. So <laughs> I promise you we are going to get somewhere eventually. But... And the funny thing about first class, right, it's so interesting. I, I was thinking about this and I was sitting there like, oh, first class is such a funny thing because any of you who've ever flown first class, you know that, first of all, it is not that much different. It's just healthier snacks, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and free alcohol, you know? You can edit that out of the, the tape, you know what I mean? Healthier snacks, right? I, and recently I was, I was on an airplane, and it's, and it's so ridiculous, but I was on an airplane and I'm, I'm sitting in, in my window seat and there's a... There are three kind of people who fly first class, right? There are people who are rich, who fly first class, which is not me. Uh, and these people sort of in, in are, they feel um, entitled to first class, right? These are the people that when you get in group one, when you get in group one, they looking at you like you're not supposed to be in group one <laughs> because group one is just for them, right? There are people who have uh, never flown first class, and this is their first time, and you can always sort of point them out because they're so timid when the snack basket comes around, right? And you get a snack basket in first class, you can take as much as you want, right? And the person's always like, oh, you know, I'll have a bag of chips, and everybody else is like, sis, you can get some more, right? <laughs> it's literally what you're paying for, right? <laughs> and then there's me, right? There's me, a person who travels so often that he has, you know, status, and also a person who is huge, right? I'm 6'3 and a half, 230 pounds. It is really difficult for me to fly six, seven, eight hours at a time cramped up on an airplane. My body has taken, taken a beating over the years. And so for me, first class is just functional. It's just the thing that I need to do so that I can stretch my legs and pull the seat back a bit so that I can survive to hopefully 70 or 80 years old. It's literally a wellness practice for me. And because I look at it that way, none of it matters. It's just another seat on the plane that I get to get on first and get off first. So I'm sitting on an airplane. I've got my head against the window seat. There's a man who comes and sits next to me. And the wonderful, wonderful flight attendant comes over. And she offers us snacks. And I, re I politely excuse myself. I 
reach over, I grab the things I need, and then this man who is on his laptop, because there's always someone on their laptops before the plane takes off, this man reaches over without looking up, and he digs his hand around, and he pulls out something, and he doesn't acknowledge her, he doesn't say hello to her, he doesn't, he doesn't thank her or any of these things, and I have a really big deal with this because I used to work in the service industry, I also used to be a social worker, and I really have a hard time with people believing that people who work in service are servants, right? It bothers me, right? By the way, if there was food in here today and if there were people walking around with your coffee, I would tell you right now, if you don't thank that person, I'm out of here, right? Right? Like, that's a big deal. Something for us to remember, these small details. And so I'm immediately upset. I'm immediately upset because I feel like this man in all of his arrogance and pomp believes that this, this woman who is trying her best to do her job is beneath him. You could have at least acknowledged her presence, her humanity, right? But I mind my business because I'm the type of person who's all the way human and things can escalate and I know myself, <laughs> right? I know myself and I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be that dude in first class and they're like, see, right? So I'm, the, so I'm like, I'm bringing it down, right? I'm bringing it down. So I put my headphones in. I put my headphones in. I lean against the window, and I'm like, I'm just going to go ahead, look this way, ignore this man, and mind my business, do a few woo saws. And then 10 minutes later, I start to hear this crinkling sound, and I don't know what the sound is. I'm eating my food. I'm drinking my drink, and I'm hearing this strange crinkling that's metallic, this metallic sound, and I can't figure out what's happening. Now, my original thought is that I've blown an a, 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 a earphone, right? Like, you know how that sound when the speaker blows, it's that weird crackling. I'm like, oh, no, I've, you know, this is a long flight. What am I going to do? I've blown a headphone. So I take the headphone out and realize that it's not the headphones. And so I glance over, and this, this man sitting next to me, this mean, arrogant man, is looking at his laptop, and in his hand are a bag of cookies, and he's trying to get the bag open, and he's trying to pull it, and he's trying to pull it, and he's trying to pull it, and it's crackling and crackling, and he's struggling, and he's getting more and more frustrated as he's looking at his laptop, and he's looking, he's looking, he's pulling, he's pulling, and then eventually he gets so mad that he just stuffs it in the pouch in front of him and doesn't have a snack. And I'm looking at this fool, <laughs> saying to myself, if he would just take a moment, <laughs> just a split second to look up, he would see that the bag is perforated. <laughs> and then all he had to do is just take a moment and just do like this. And then the thing. Anyway, usually what happens is I land on these flights because I travel so much. I have a loving mother that I, I, I would lay my life down for. She raised me and my siblings and sacrificed her life for us. So usually what happens because I travel so much is that when I land in D.C., the first thing I do is I go see my mom. Right? I need to check on her, make sure she's all right, make sure she's got her groceries, make sure that the air conditioner is working, make sure that the, she's always like, Jason, the printer's acting funny, like all the things, right? So I go to my mother's house to check on her. Now, my mother is a very specific person. My mom is a particular kind of lady. Uh, she has her routines, her habits, much like you or your mothers do, right? She's got her programs that she likes to watch every single day. You know, five to seven is a blocked off time. You know what's going to happen, right? Five to six is a specific program, and six to seven is like her stories and she's got to watch the stories you know like young and the restless and this that and the third right over and over again and so I know what I'm walking into when I walk into her house I also know that my mother loves for me to stay and watch these things with her it's the way that we bond as, as she's gotten older and I've gotten older these small moments matter more right so I get to the house and I'm really trying to pop in and out Right? I'm exhausted from this flight. I'm still frustrated from this guy. I'm like, I just want to pop in. Ma, everything good? If so, I will see you in a couple of days. I'll come over and make sure everything is solid. Right? Instead, what happens is, because of the timing, I walk into her house, and she says, you right on time. Right? <laughs> I say, for what? She says, my show getting ready to come on. Now, this particular show, which I will not say the name of, because this is being filmed, and I don't want this person to sue me, right? because I ain't got nothing anyway. She says, she knows this particular show I don't like to watch. It's a talk show. The host of this talk show, I find to be positive in some ways, but the ways in which this person negative has everything to do with the fact that they are extraordinarily misogynistic. Right? Some of you in this room know this talk show. It's no longer on the air as of recent. Don't say it out loud. 
It's always that one person, right? It's like we're trying to keep it, you know. So I go and I sit down. My mom is like, okay, it's coming on, it's coming on. Show comes on. Now, I'm already like, Ma, you know I can't, you know, I can't do this. And she says, well, we got to keep watching, Jay. You got to stay enough to finish the show because after the show, it's Family Feud. <laughs> and we have to watch Family Feud. By the way, just so y'all know, I just feel like we should have, can we just have an honest moment really quickly as if I haven't given you 10 minutes of honesty already. I just want to make sure, and I'm going to give y'all a little bit of a secret about Family Feud. And this will be the thing that gets me never invited back to this program, by the way. So we watch Family Feud because black people root for the black family on Family Feud. I just want to make sure, I just think like, I feel like it's never been, it's never been discussed, right? It's never been addressed, but it's a truth. And I want, make, I want to make sure we all know it's the truth. I want to put it out there. We figure we can get any win we can, right? Every win counts. And so, we, so that's what it is for my mom and I. It's like, we're going to watch this show. We're going to root for the Johnsons. This is what it's going to be, right? Every day, this is our thing. I know some of you are like, wait a minute, this is a thing? And all the black people are like, this is a thing, right? <laughs> this is a thing, right? It, it is what it is. So I get there. My mom is like, Jay, you can't leave because Family Feud comes on after this. And you know you got to stay for Family Feud. So I say, okay, Ma, I'm going to stay. The show comes on. And the host of the show says, today's episode is going to be about dating. Immediately, I'm a little nauseous because I know where it's going. And I, and I want to preface this by saying, this is a true story. This was a true episode. This is not how I feel, right? But I, I, there is, we're going to get somewhere. But bear with me on this part. We're going to talk about dating. I've invited three young ladies onto my show. They are in new relationships. I am going to give them the how-to for their new partners to fall further in love with them. These are the secrets and the tricks necessary to get the person that likes you to love you. So the ladies come on. They're all so well-dressed, and they're there, and this guy says, so you know it's a man, obviously, because I, I ruined it, right? This guy says, uh, okay, ladies, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you the three principles that you're going to need, and then I'm going to send you out into the world on your dates, and we're going to videotape. We're going to have a private camera in your glasses or on lapel pins or whatever it is, and we're going to film the whole date. And if you do these three things, I guarantee you it's going to work. Okay, well, what's the first thing? The first thing is when you get to your date, the first thing I want you to do is do something to embarrass yourself. Now, at this point, I like get up, right? My mother is patting me on the knee, sit, 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 right? <laughs> We're just getting started, right? <laughs> See it through. You got to embarrass yourself, this person says, the host says. Embarrass ourselves, yeah. Just do something to embarrass yourself. As soon as you get on a date, play yourself out. Do something silly. Make a fool of yourself. Make yourself look small. Right. I can hear somebody like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I know. Then he said, the next thing I'd like you to do is I want you to develop an inside joke. Now, immediately I turn to my mother and I say, Mom, that's not the way inside jokes work. You can't just make up an inside joke. Like, <laughs> inside jokes just happen, right? Like, I do a thing, you do a thing, we laugh about it. Then it's like, this is our inside joke. But you can't say, this is going to be our inside joke. Let's do this thing. Like, it's not the way it works, right? But that's the advice that he gives. Like, Look, I want you to develop an, in, to develop an inside joke. And the, and, and the young women are like, we'll, we'll, we'll try, right? And then he said, and the final thing I want you to do, the thing that's going to really drive this thing home, is I want you to thank him, because these were all heterosexual relationships, I want you to thank him profusely, over and over again, for every minor detail. Now, at this point, I, I could like, I'm like white knuckling, right? I'm like, I'm so angry. And my mother has the strangest smirk because she knows that I'm sweating, right? And she's rubbing my back like, just, just bear with me. Let's just keep watching. Because for her, it's, it's hate watch, right? We're just hate watching the show, right? But me, I'm like, I hate, hate the show. So I'm like, I really can't do this, right? And she's like, oh, it'll be fine. Don't forget Family Feud, right? <laughs> we just, this is a means to an end, right? So 
they cut to commercial break, they come back, and then they send these young women out on dates with their, with their, their respective partners. Of course, for me, the first thing I recognize is, you know, the ladies are all, like, dressed to the nine, and, and then, like, all their boyfriends got on, like, Jordans, you know what I mean? It always bothers me, you know what I mean? Like, I, like, I come in here like this, but if we were on a date, I would, I would put myself together, right? It's weird. I, and some of you have seen that. You walk down, like, you, you hanging out in New York, and you walk down the street, it's like, bro, sh you didn't know she was going to get dressed up? Like, you, you ain't know where y'all were going? Like, and he's like, I got on my best sweatpants, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> These the best ones, you know? These the new Jordan 4s, man. These is like $200, you know what I mean? Silly, 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 right? So they get to the, they get to the restaurant. They get to the restaurant. And the first thing, so there's, there's three of them. I only can remember what two of them did. Um, but the first one, the one I'll never forget, is they, they sit down at the table. And the first one, and she says, oh, can I get a glass of Merlot? And the waiter pours the Merlot. And then she just, like, knocks the glass off the table. Because the first rule is the rule of embarrassment. Be it's, it's the wildest thing. Because the first rule is the rule of embarrassment, right? The wine goes all over her, all over him, all over the floor. It's everywhere. She's like, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry. Even though he just watched her literally swipe the wine, like... <laughs> Swipe the wine off the table, right? The wine is all over the place, right? And she's cleaning it up. He's cleaning it up. It's a whole mess. The waiter crew is over. The mopping is happening. All this stuff is going on, right? And she's like, oh, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed. They cut to the other date. And this lady in a beautiful red dress decides that her embarrassment would be, hey, this, they, they were like gym rats. So she's like, hey, how many push-ups do you think I could do in this dress? This is a true story. I, you could probably, if you know what show this is, you could probably YouTube this episode. And she gets on the floor of the restaurant and just starts pumping it out in a dress and heels. And her partner is looking like, what is happening? <clears throat> the waiters have gathered around and everyone is like, we don't know what we're supposed to do in this moment, should we call someone? Should we call security? Should we tell her, miss, the food is coming soon. Please get up off the floor, right? Like, and she just down there doing her thing, right? Then they cut back to the first lady, and the first lady now has to figure out an inside joke. Again, I look over to my mom, I say, hey, mom, you do know, right? That ain't really how. She's like, I know, I know, I know. Let's just see what happens. She has to figure out an inside joke, and so they come up with some silly game where every time the waiter comes over and pours the water, they crack some kind of joke and they laugh about it. So, of course, what they do is they take a sip, the waiter comes, they laugh, they, they crack the joke, they take another sip, the waiter comes, they crack the joke, and the waiter does not know what they're laughing at, which makes it funny, right? It makes it funnier, right? Because the waiter can't figure out what is happening because they keep taking a sip. And, of course, this is abusive to the server, to the server right? But they keep doing it, and the server's pouring and pouring and pouring, and they're laughing and laughing and laughing. I don't remember what the lady, in the, after the push-ups, I was like, I have no idea. I've, I've checked out, right? I've pushed it back in my mind at this point. And then they get to the part where the, the, the host of the show said, you're supposed to thank him profusely. Exorbitant thanks. And so what would happen is the food comes out. And the ladies on the date just start like, I've never seen anything like it. Like, thank you for bringing me here. It's like, I ain't bringing you here. The host of the show brought you here, right? <laughs> Thank you for bringing me here. Thank you for putting on your best sneakers. Thank you for, you know, one of them, like, moved a fork over. Thank you for moving my fork. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. I mean, it was, like, sickening for me, right? Sickening for me because I'm like, man, we are really moving backward, right? This is a really tough thing to watch, this sort of strange groveling for no apparent reason, an unwarranted sort of groveling, right? I'm like, this is strange. Strange, strange, strange. So all this happens over the course of the first uh, 15, 16 minutes of the show, and then they come back into the studio. Now it's time to process and figure out how things went. This time, the boyfriends are with them. The host of the show says, all right, fellas, now we're going to figure out how it all went down. I'm going to ask y'all some questions. We're going to kind of process this thing and see how you feel about your partners after they've done these three rules. I'm like, all right. In my mind, I'm like, this is going to be a train wreck. Now I'm interested, right? And so he says, uh, let's start at the first, the first thing. When, when she knocked the wine glass off the table, how did you feel? And uh, the guy said, you know, honestly, first I was just wondering why she knocked. I mean, she literally slapped the wine glass off the table. 
Like, it wasn't like a fumble. It was kind of just like, boom, right? And so I was just saying to myself, I wonder why she did that, you know? <clears throat> he said, but after the embarrassment of it all, he said, I'd be lying if I said that it was a much easier date because we could kind of take off airs, right? The airs came down. All of the, the sort of pressure that we feel on these dates, the pressure that we feel in romantic situations, the pressure that we feel to be performative in these sort of formal settings, right? Now we're stripped away because we had already played ourselves out. There's red wine on me, right? There's wine all over her. There's wine all over the floor. Everything that was supposed to be so cool about us no longer is cool. Now we get to be ourselves. And I was like, well, that's interesting. He asked the other guy, what about you? And he said, hey, man, I'm not going to lie to you. The push-ups, that was a bit much, right? <laughs> he said, well, how did you handle it? He said, well, when I realized around push-up number 20 or 30 that she wasn't going to get up, I got down there with her. I didn't, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. He said, I was, I was so concerned, I had no clue. And I was like, well, I guess, I guess this is my cue. As he kneels down on the floor, I, was like, I guess we're doing this until we're not doing it no more, right? And they, they went on and did their push-ups. He said, well, what about the next step? What about the next step? What about the inside joke? And the lady said, well, you know, I almost said his name. Mm, you won't get me. <laughs> oh, man, never going to get on that show. Um, <laughs> he said, what about the inside joke? He said, well, she said, well, at first I was like, it seems a little silly to, to make up our inside joke, but over time, it really did get funny because it was something we could look forward to. It was something that the two of us understood that, this sort of, that the waiter didn't know. And so every time the waiter would come over, it was just the keeping of a secret that made it really, really funny. Even though it was a contrived secret, it was just ours. It was our contrived secret, right? It was a silly and goofy thing that we decided to make up that we literally sort of put together for the sake of this, this sort of experiment that you got us on, but over the course of the day, as it continued to happen and we stuck to it, it actually became organically funny. And it was a thing that kind of bonded us in the middle of a date. No matter what happened, no matter every, every time that our sort of conversation would dwindle, the moment the waiter would come and fill the coffee cup, I mean, the water cups, it would reactivate itself because we had an inside joke to lean on, right? And I was like, oh, interesting. And then he said, well, Fellas, I want to know what it felt like to be thanked one million times in, a, in, in 20 minutes, right? And this is the part I lean in on because this is the part that made me the most angry, right? So I'm like, yeah, how did it feel? Because this is, this is ridiculous. And, that, and the guy says, well, I'll be honest. At first, it was a little strange because I wasn't doing anything that, that warranted a thanks. And so it made me feel awkward. It made, it, there was dissonance there. It made me feel... Uh, unsettled intrinsically, unsettled internally. And so I started to ask myself why I felt so strange on the inside. And then I realized that the reason I felt so strange is because I just don't hear thank you very often, right? That I'm not, I, I don't hear it very often, right? And this has nothing to do with me being a man. Just in general, I don't know if we say thank you to each other very often in general. Um, and so being told thank you over and over again felt awkward. It felt like somebody sort of shooting arrows at me. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. And then Family Feud comes on, right? <laughs> the end of the show, right? I'm like, do you love them? They're like, we love them, right? And, it's like, and I was like, that's dumb, but whatever, right? <laughs> show goes off, Family Feud comes on, Johnson's win. It become, and, and just like that, all's well that ends well, right? <laughs> I get back to my house which is about a mile and a half into the city. I get back to my, my, my house. I get into bed. I've been traveling all day. I've got my backpack, same backpack that's right there. I've got, uh, I jump into bed. I open up my laptop because now I have to go through and check all the emails that I've missed throughout the day, right? When you travel, obviously, people are emailing you when you're missing those things. When I'm with my mom, I try not to check anything because I'm with my mother. And so now I have to play catch up. We all know this game. So I open up my laptop. All the emails come flooding in. Now, here's the way it works in my world. I get emailed by a few people. Number one, my assistant. She emails me and tells me all the things that I'm not doing right and that she needs from me immediately, right? Number two, my agent. My agent tells me, Jason, here's what we got going on. We got this, 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 
and this on your plate, and I need you to get this work done because we have things to take care of. My editor, Jason, I need you to turn in your, your edits. I need you to give me your, your acknowledgments, your dedications. I need you to okay the book covers. I need you to okay but, right, all the trim size, the fonts, all these things that have to go into book publishing. And then, after all those people, there are teachers, librarians, and parents. Emails coming in, right, because I write books for young people. Some of you in this room have children. I guarantee your children are probably reading these books. Some of you in this room have parents or spouses who are, who are, who are teachers. I'm guaranteeing you, your, your, your spouses are teaching these books. And so all the emails are coming in, and I have to go through and read them, and 90% of those emails say the exact same thing. We don't understand what it is you're doing that's causing our children to read. We've been trying to figure this out for the last 20 years as, my, as a teacher, and I can't figure out for the life of me why all of a sudden whatever you're doing is causing our children to engage with literature. And we'd like to know what you think it is. Right? It should come as no surprise to you, as I've been speaking for the last 20, 25 minutes, that I have no clue what it is. <laughs> Not a clue, right? Yeah, I mean, I, it's, I, I wish I knew the answer, right? But, 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 on this particular night, and literally what I would normally do is say, Honestly, I'm really grateful for you teaching the books. I'm really grateful for you, for your kids sort of loving these books. Please tell your young people that I say I love them and that I'm grateful for them and that hopefully one day I get to meet them. Um, but I don't know, right? Sincerely, Jason, right? But on this particular day, having left my mother's house, having been riled up by the most sexist, maddening thing I'd experienced during that day except for the fool on the airplane, I realized that on this day, maybe I had an answer. And I started to think about the TV show. And I started to think about the three rules. And I started to figure out how to transmute them from that place to what I do. And I said to myself, all right, well, if rule number one is to embarrass yourself, perhaps it's not necessarily about embarrassment. Perhaps it's about humility. Right? Embarrassment is the word that he, that he chose, but perhaps it's actually about the exercising of humility. Right? So I said to myself, well, how do I exercise humility in my work? Well, the first thing that I do is I show up to the page knowing that I don't know much. See, I'm 35 years old. I, we'd like to believe that we know what it means to, live, to, to be able to tell the stories of a 15-year-old, but the truth is they're living different lives than we lived. We'd like to believe that they aren't, that nothing changes, that it's all the same, that we have the answers. The arrogance of adulthood does that, especially if you actually see yourself as grown, right? And so I say to myself, well, I show up to the page knowing that I don't know much, so I call my 17-year-old little brother and ask him some questions, right? Or I hang out with kids and listen to what they're saying and eavesdrop, and then I approach the page with humility, and then after approaching the page with humility, I write characters who actually get to live in humble spaces. What does that mean? That means that when you're a kid who come from my neighborhood, especially if you are a young boy, I gotta figure out how to show you on the page humbled. Not humbled by the environment, but like internally humbled. Show you on the page crying. Why can't you be seen weak? And not really weak, right? Why can't you be seen vulnerable? To put that in the book gives young men who never feel vulnerable an opportunity to share a secret. There are kids who, get, who have to walk around sort of layered. If you grew up where I grew up, you had to walk around with layers of force fields. Layers of force fields, and then you get to the school, and the school is like, hey, this kid's a tough kid. He's a rough kid. He's a bad kid. No, no, no. This kid is surviving, and in order to survive, it's really, really dangerous to, to, to exercise any level of vulnerability because vulnerability will get you eaten, right? So what I say, right? And so what I say is, what if I could write characters that can be vulnerable and not get eaten? And then young folks can go there and share their secrets within those pages. What if I could say at 15, 16 years old that it's okay for you to be afraid of sex? It's okay to, you be, to not be ready for the big things. It's okay to, for you to want to be a little different than the people in your community. It's okay. What if I could put all that in the book? That, right, humble kids, kids who are exercising humility in a way that they can't do in real life. What if I could do that? That would be interesting. Then I said to myself, man, the second part 
The second part of this thing, it, it, the inside joke, it, it wasn't really about a quote-unquote inside joke. It was about the building of intimacy. Because that's what inside jokes do. Right? Like, that's literally what we all do every single day. Listen, you want to see an inside joke? This is going to be amazing, by the way. I'm, I'm telling you now, it's going to feel like a magic trick to some of you. But to, to others of you, this is going to feel like normal, right? Inside joke. If you are a person of color in this room, you know what this means. Like, think about, like, now think about how amazing that is. Like, like, now, I don't know none of y'all. I never met none of y'all. But we immediately are connected, right? I immediately feel safe knowing that you know what that means, right? People are like, what is happening? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's humanity, humanity can be ingenious when we allow it. What an incredible thing. What an, like immediately what you, just, what you just witnessed was a webbing of connectivity instantaneously because of our shared experiences. We build intimacy through that inside joke I just cracked that you all will not, we ain't telling you neither. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but you just witnessed the creation of intimacy. Right? Immediate intimacy. What an amazing thing. And that's what the show host was trying to tell the girls. Like, oh, yeah, just make an inside joke. It's not about the joke. It's about the building of intimacy. So I say to myself, oh, I wonder how I build intimacy in the literature. How do I build intimacy when I'm writing these books for our children? Well, the first thing I do is I think about our language. Right? Language is the cornerstone of culture. Every single culture is built from language first. So often, so many of us, our language has been told that it's improper and incorrect. But if you tell me that my language is improper and incorrect, what you're actually telling me is that my culture is improper and incorrect. My language is different from yours. It is a variation. But it is mine. And it is coded. And it has a history. And it is special. And it shouldn't be made to be less valuable because it is not quote unquote standard. Thank God it's not. Right? It's the thing that we've used to survive for so long. So what if, right? So what if, what if I could, what if I could literally put my language in the book that felt so real that it immediately formed bonds with the reader who speaks the same language? See, the beauty of, our gener of the young generation is that hip-hop, rap music, this thing that came from my culture and my generation, grew up right in the middle of it. We're in New York City, the birthplace of it, the most powerful art form in the, on the face of the planet. The beauty of it is that what used to be a New York City thing has now become youth culture around the world. So my natural language is the language of all young people. What a cheat code, right? <laughs> and so I figure if I put that language in a book, it don't matter where you come from. You understand it now. It don't matter what you have, where you live, what your skin color is, that language you directly connect to because now it's universal youth culture. Amazing. Right? So I said, let me get the language right. Number two, how do you build the inside joke? How do you build the intimacy? You, you're honest. You show the things that they don't know you know. The reason that everybody loves magic, the reason that magic will never go away, magic tricks, magicians, the reason that they will continue to thrive is because every human being on earth wants to believe that someone else knows what they're thinking. It is a human thing. It is a phenomenon that we love. We want to believe that somebody else knows our thoughts. It's why church is always going to be a thing and all other religions. It's why it, this, is, this is how it works. We love somebody picking our card, right, that somebody could know. So I put it on the page as honestly as possible so that they can see, oh, wait a minute. I never read that before, but that's how I feel. That's what I say. Those are the jokes we crack, all the things that are, like, off the limits, when you club, by the way, if you think that they ain't, like, you know, just put your ear to their door when they don't think you around, right? And then you're going to hear who they really are, right? And then I said to myself, well, I wonder how I show this last element, right? On the show, he said, thank the people, pro thank the men profusely. And I said to myself, it isn't about sort of this profuse thanks. It's simply the exercise of gratitude. Gratitude. How am I showing gratitude in my work? Well... I'm showing young people as they are, not who we project them to be. I'm showing them as they are today in all their brilliance and brokenness. Ain't no lessons being taught. Trust me, they know what's hokey. They know what's corny. I'm not a teacher. I'm not even a parent. I just want to be a witness to your lives. And that is the way I say thank you. Then, after cracking this code and writing this email, I said to myself, 
what if it's not really about the books? Like I work as a writer, right? It's, it's, it's the thing that I use, the tool that I use, but the truth of the matter is that these three elements, humility, intimacy, and gratitude, yeah, I think that's what helps me write the books in a way that seem effective, but I don't, if they only stop with books, then we failed. What if, what if these are the three elements that literally form relationship with you, between human beings? What if these are the three things that could govern our lives in general? So I say, well, what does it look like? I said, and this is the part where it connects to you. What does it look like for me? Well, for me, that everyday, that everyday humility looks like me asking young people what, it, what is wrong instead of me assuming that I know. For you, it is asking your clients, your neighbors, the people who are, who are taking the support of housing that we are so grateful for you for, and making sure that you are listening more than you are speaking. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but the choir still has to learn new songs sometimes, right? So it's necessary for us to do this, right? right? It's necessary. <clears throat> Make sure that you're listening, right? Everybody, ha any of y'all who have children in here, you know that when your baby come home and she's like, oh, ma, I'm, I'm sad. You're like, oh, you probably just hungry. Mm. <clears throat> We've all been there, right? And she's like, ma, I just told you I was sad. Like, I think I know how I feel. <laughs> but that's what we do. A little humility, a little, a little humility goes a, a long way. We always say that young people are the most entitled part of our society when I've never known a more entitled group than adults. <laughs> we really believe we deserve the things that we get. And the truth of the matter is, is that we don't. We still have to ask questions. We don't know everything. They are not half-formed things. They are whole things who are younger than we are. The people who are in your buildings are not half-formed things. They are whole things who have had different experiences that have led them there. That's all, right? The second thing I say, well, how do I operate with a level of intimacy in my everyday life? Well, for me, I realize with young people, you can't expect them to give you nothing till you give a little bit of yourself. It's strange how we walk into spaces and say that because I am who I am, I deserve your respect. Because I'm Jason Reynolds, I deserve your respect. No, 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 no. I have to earn it. And in order for me to earn it, I got to let you know who I am. There are young folks who have seen more than you'll ever see. So to, so to ask them to tell you all about their lives is a dangerous thing for a kid. Why don't you tell me who you are first? Why don't you let me know who you are? Give me some of you and then I'm going to give you a little bit of me. If you got folks in your building, it's the same. I used to be a social worker, by the way. It's, so shout out to my social workers in the building. I got a lot of love and respect for you, right? It, but it works the same way. And I know we got all the boundaries. We got boundary laws. We got HIPAA laws. We got all the laws, right? I get it, right? But we got to figure out the loophole to give just enough for them to feel like they can give a little more of themselves, and then we can better help, right? And then lastly, it was like, well, how often do I operate in a space of, in a space of gratitude? And if we all were being honest, not as often as necessary. The truth is, we got to start being really, really, really open about our gratitude with the people that we work for. And what I mean by that is, I tell young people all the time, thank you, not for doing anything in particular, just for being who they are. See, if young folks don't exist, I don't stand on the stage. If they don't exist, I don't have a purpose. Right? If the folks in your buildings, the folks that you're helping, if they don't exist, the folks that you are servicing, right, which is what we're all doing. You, we are serving people. The folks that you serve, if they don't exist, you ain't got a point or a job. <laughs> so the least you could do is say thank you just for being who they are. Just I tell kids all the time, thanks for showing up in class because I know what some of you have had to go through to get here. Had to jump through hoops just to get to school. The least I could do is say thank you, show you that I'm grateful for you showing up. Grateful for your existence and your presence in my life. It is important that we do that to each other, even in this room. Say thank you to people. Let them know that you are grateful for their lives, for their existence on this planet. It is an important thing that we don't do enough of. But if we did, it changes the culture immediately. The whole temperature of a room changes if we just could express a little gratitude. So that's what I want to leave you with. Humility, intimacy, gratitude. Yes, it came from a strange TV show, but these might be the tenets... <laughs> But these might be, these might be the tenets of life, the next three commandments, right? <laughs> it very well could be the case that this could be the thing that could lead us to where we need to go. And if you don't want to take these things into consideration, then you are no better than that man in first class struggling with that bag. <laughs> so arrogant when all he had to do was look up 
and see that it's perforated. The people that we serve are perforated. They are ready for you to open them. They are ready for you to know what is inside. You just have to take a moment to pay attention. I appreciate y'all. Have a good day.